The anchor of the soul is a really unusual anchor and is hooked in the soul as firmly as it is hooked in the Holy of Holies. That's what I want to try to persuade you. So that you walk out of here this morning as a child of God, feeling both that your anchor is hooked in heaven by virtue of the blood of Christ, pleading your cause before the Father infallibly, and that that anchor is hooked in you and your soul as firmly, as infallibly, as Almighty God can possibly hook it. What is the sure hope that God has given us to strengthen us when all around our souls gives way? In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper turns to Hebrews 6, 9 to 12 to explore the source of our confidence in the face of life's challenges. His sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on October 20th, 1996. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What does it mean to lay hold on hope? Verse 18. You see that at the end of verse 18? We who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. That's not something your hands do. That's something your heart does. This writer is so zealous to get God's encouragement for your hope into you that he grasps for another image of hope in verse 19 and namely the anchor. Let's read this again. Verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. And then he describes it in three ways. Both sure, number one, And steadfast, number two. And three, one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So what's the anchor? The anchor of our soul, it says, is this hope that he just referred to in verse 18. We have this hope as an anchor of the soul. But we got to be more precise than that. Verse 18 says, We have strong encouragement who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. That is, the anchor, which it says this hope is in verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor, referring back to verse 18, this hope is the future Glory, blessing, promise, inheritance, which is out there in heaven, guaranteed for us. And he says, that's our anchor for the soul. So this writer is very eager to teach us that our subjective hoping is rooted, anchored in an objective hope that's out there. He describes it as sure, steadfast, and one that enters in the veil. Now that's a strange image. You've got an anchor. Anchors usually go down in water, not up in temples. But here you got an anchor, big, heavy, strong, unbreakable anchor of the soul, and it's not going down in the water. It's going up into heaven, And through a veil, now what's that? Remember the the Old Testament tabernacle had a, a vestibule and the priest could go in and out there regularly, the showbread and all that. And then there was another veil behind which was the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. And 
You could only go there as a high priest once a year, taking a sacrifice, the blood, for the redemption of the people. That's what split. When Christ's blood was shed, his rent flesh, Hebrew says, is the opening of the veil. And now he enters into the Holy of Holies where God dwells in his glory and where the Ark of the Covenant is. And the anchor is there, hooked on the Ark of the Covenant. That's my picture anyway. It doesn't say that. But it's there, in there, and God has got this anchor hooked and all tied around with this massive chain around the covenant promises of God. And God's almighty sovereign hand is on it. So it's not going anywhere. It is sure and steadfast. Now, what, what does it mean that Christ went in there. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. The anchor goes in the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He's a high priest and he's gone forever. Unlike those Old Testament priests who died and had to be replaced, who went with their, not their own blood, but the blood of animals which can never take away sins. They went in on earth. He goes in in heaven. So here's Christ taking his own blood by the power of an indestructible life, entering into the holy place, spreading his own blood before the Father on the Ark of the Covenant, making atonement for the sins of his people forever. That's the anchor. Or that's the ground of the anchor. And that secures for us a future that is bright, a blessing, an inheritance, a hope, a life. And it is as sure as the blood of Christ is valuable. Now, here's my question. Is the anchor of my soul as firmly attached to my soul as it is to the altar of God? Does that concern you? Is the image that we are to have in our minds here that by virtue of the work of Christ, the anchor end of the chain and the rope is firm, steadfast, penetrating the veil, wrapped around the Ark of the Covenant, secured by the almighty hand of God bought by the blood of Jesus and it is absolutely immovable and the rope of the anchor dangles in the air in front of my face. Is that the picture that that you have? Is, Is the security being talked about in last week's text and this week's text only one end of the rope That Christ bought the security of one end of the rope. It's fixed in heaven. It can never break loose. But here at this end, whether I hold on or take hold. I mean, would it encourage you if you were on a boat and somebody said to you, I've got a great anchor. So that when the wind blows and it tends to either blow you onto the rocks or blow you out to sea, I got an anchor for you. And look at it. It's big. It's sharp. When you drop it, it hooks. Man, it won't go anywhere. And then he says, but the rope just lays across the deck. Encouraging? Is that, we're secure. All you have to do is grab it. Hold it like this when the wind is blowing. I'm not encouraged. If that's the image, I'm just not encouraged. This soul is only as secure as both ends are secure. And if all Christ has done is secure one end and leave to these weak, sinful hands the other end, there ain't no security. And so what I want to do is try to persuade you in the last part of the sermon that the image in this text is that the anchor of the soul 
is a really unusual anchor and is hooked in the soul as firmly as it is hooked in the Holy of Holies. That's what I want to try to persuade you. So that you walk out of here this morning as a child of God, feeling both that your anchor is hooked in heaven by virtue of the blood of Christ, pleading your cause before the Father infallibly, and that that anchor is hooked in you and your soul as firmly, as infallibly, as Almighty God can possibly hook it. Here are my four reasons for believing that. Number one, look at verse 9 of chapter 6. Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. Now let me stop and explain the context in case you forgot. He's just given these awful warnings that you can drift away from God. You can be like a field that gets a lot of rain coming down on it and brings up thorns and thistles instead of fruit for the one who planted it. And you can apostatize, forsake God, fall away and be lost. And the, the, you can just picture the listeners trembling. Why does he write to us this way? Then he gets to verse 9 and he says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. Things that accompany or literally belong to or are possessed by or had by salvation. Now get this. Think very clearly here. What are the better things? Well, the bad things were falling away, committing apostasy, forsaking the Lord. And he says, but for you, there's going to be better things, meaning you're going to hold on. You're not going to let go. You're going to be hooked in. You're going to make it. You're going to stay on the narrow way. You're going to get to heaven. How do I know? It belongs to salvation. It's not added on by something you do to salvation. Salvation possesses the better things. A person who is in salvation is guaranteed better things than apostasy. Which means if you go down now to verse 19 and picture the anchor, we got an anchor in heaven and it's the anchor of our soul. This salvation that gets me to glory and into the presence of God and joy forever and ever is a salvation that includes, possesses, to which belongs better things than drifting out to sea or crashing on the rocks. That is, the anchor holding in the boat is as sure as the anchor holding in heaven. I believe that's taught in verse 9. Here's reason number 2. Chapter 3, verse 14, if you want to look at it. Remember the tense of the verbs here are very, very, very important. We have become partakers of Christ... That's a great statement. We have become partakers, partners, sharers in Christ. We're united to Him. The rope is in us. It's wound around us. We're united to Christ. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm to the end. Now notice what it does not say. It does not say we will become partakers of Christ if we hold fast. Like the holding fast is, oh, i got to hold fast, or i got to hold fast because if I don't hold fast, I will become, become someday by some kind of merit of strong holding on, a partaker of Jesus. That's not what it says. It says we have become. It's already happened if you're holding fast. Becoming a sharer in Christ by faith binds you together with Jesus, which is just another way of saying that the rope is all tied around you and the massive hand of Christ is holding it there and your ship will not go down. It won't go out. It won't go on the rocks. It is as secure there as it is in heaven. Here's argument number three. Hebrews chapter three, verse six. You may remember that the comparison is between Moses and Christ and Christ is compared 
to Moses in that Moses was a part of the house and Christ was the maker and the master of the house. And then he says, Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, tense is important here again, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope firm to the end. Now notice again what it does not say. It does not say we will become his house if we hold fast. Just get that clear. It's so important. It does not say, okay, the way to get saved is by getting a hold and holding on and then I become his house. This says we are his house now if in the future we go on holding fast, which must mean that there's something in the house that evidences itself by the holding on. The holding on is not an independent, self-wrought, John Piper produced act. It is a house produced act. He made the house. He masters the house. He dwells in the house. And he takes the hands of the house and he puts them on the rope. And he keeps his hands on the hands so that I don't let go. And that's my only hope. If you're holding on this morning to the hope set before you, God has done it. God has done it. Final argument. This is the most important one for me. Chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. The reason I love this passage so much and it comes back again and again in my thinking is because it's about the new covenant fulfillment. You remember the new covenant? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. There's coming a day, Moses says, when I will, God says, circumcise their hearts so that they will love me. God's going to do the heart work. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. I will take out of them the heart of stone and I will put in the heart of flesh and I will cause them to walk in my statutes. God will do the heart work in the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 33. I will write my law upon their hearts and put my statutes within them. Jeremiah 32, 40. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. That is, they will not let go of the rope. That's my pledge in the new covenant. Luke 22, 20. Jesus says at the Lord's Supper, this cup, is the new covenant by my blood. So when Christ died, he bought the new covenant. He sealed it. He secured it. The new covenant promises are yours in Christ. If you're covered with the blood, justified by the blood, the new covenant is yours. Now, that means that the taking hold of the rope on the deck and the being bound up with it was bought by Jesus. Now read it. Let's look at these verses. Verses 20 to 21 of chapter 13, Hebrews. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the Eternal covenant. There it is again. The blood of the eternal. It's not a covenant that's going to abort. It's not a covenant that's going to be replaced. The blood of the eternal covenant. Even Jesus our Lord, may this God who brought up this shepherd by this blood, may this God equip you with every good thing to do His will. Working in us. There's where the rope is dangling, folks. And it ain't dangling. It ain't dangling. Working in us, in us, that which is pleasing in His sight. Now stop there. we got more to read, but stop there. What pleases God when He comes to you and says, Take hold of your hope. 
Taking hold of it pleases God. Who enables you to do that? Working in us that which is pleasing in His sight. God does. Now here's the most important phrase. Through Jesus Christ. Now in the context of verses 20 and 21, we're not left to wonder too much what the through Jesus Christ means. Because we've just heard that He's the great shepherd of the sheep and He shed the blood of the eternal covenant and that covenant was the promise that says, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will write my law in your heart. I will circumcise you so that you love me. I will put the fear of you in me. I will not let you turn from me. That's what He bought and that's what is wrought. And therefore, is it any wonder that at the end of the verse it says, to whom, that is to this Christ, be the glory. Not to John Piper in his hands, holding on to the rope, so that when I get to heaven, God says, nice hands, good biceps, too bad the other weaklings couldn't do it. There won't be any words like that in heaven. Jesus will get the glory that you held on because Jesus wrought your holding on. The rope is not lying across the deck. It's tied everywhere. It's tied everywhere. Your soul is tied Your heart is tied. Your mind is tied. Your money is tied. Your hands are tied. And you're rising into the Holy of Holies. One last question. If this is true, if if the anchor is in the Holy of Holies, wrapped around the Ark of the Covenant and God's almighty hand is on it, making it secure... And if the other end of the anchor is in my soul and in my mind and my heart and has bound me by new covenant promises to God, why does God command me at the cost of my life to take hold of the rope? And here's the answer. What Christ bought when he shed his blood for me and you was not freedom from having to hold on, but the enabling power to hold on. What he bought for me was not the nullification of my will to hold on, but the empowering of my will to hold on, freeing of my will. To hold on. What he bought for me was not the canceling of the commandment that I must hold on, but the fulfillment of the commandment that I must hold on. What he bought for me was not the end of small group exhortation as though it were superfluous, but the triumph of exhortation so that it can be successful in our small groups. I close with this word, because when I read this last night as I was finishing up, I said, there it is. There it is. They'll get it. If I say this, they'll get it. (laughs) Oh, this is so close to the center of Christianity. If you get this, you've got it all. You've got the new covenant and the preciousness of being taken hold of by Jesus. Here it is. When Christ died for you, He bought for you The capacity and the will to do what Paul did in Philippians 3.12. Paul said, Not that I have already obtained, nor am already perfect, but I take hold. There's the image. I take hold of that for which I have been taken hold of by Christ. Remember that verse? It's in the Bible. I mean, sometimes 
verses are so theologically perfectly designed to wrap up a sermon that you wonder, oh, this is wonderful. Let me say it again because this is your life. As you go out of here this morning, I want you to feel two things. I want you to feel an impulse. I must reach out and take hold on hope. And I want you to feel the impulse. And what else can I do? For I have been taken hold of by an almighty Christ. So here it is. Not that I have already attained, nor am already perfect, but I take hold of that for which I have been taken hold of by Christ. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 12-part series, Christ, Our Hope, with a sermon titled, Saved Forever. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.